Welcome back to the second hour of our program. You know, sometimes the best way to understand the present is to understand the past. Uh, but, you know, we need context to understand what's actually going on right now. There's, there's some hot stuff going on in North Carolina, and there is a backstory to it. Laura Flanders is on the line with us, the host and executive producer of The Laura Flanders Show. Uh, it's on TV and radio and YouTube and 300 PBS stations. She's also the author of numerous books, and you can find her podcast at lauraflanders.org. Uh, also, Grit Laura, G R I T Laura, is her Twitter handle. Laura, welcome back to the program. It's been a while. Tell us about uh, Cedric Harrison. Well, Cedric is a wonderful man and wonderful to talk to you, Tom. It has been too long. Cedric is a wonderful man who runs Black Heritage Tours in Wilmington, North Carolina. His tour company is called Wilmington in Color, in case people want to take a trip with him. He tells you the story of the one successful coup ever to happen in the United States, which happened in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. Now, you talk about the 60s and 70s. Go to Wilmington today, and they are unearthing the history of the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, which was buried for almost a century. In the last 10, 20 years or so, they've been rediscovering what has laid hidden in plain sight, which is a history of a white supremacist coup that, that used the media of the day, propaganda, and oratorical speeches by a guy that looked a whole lot like the orange man um, to rile up a mob and unleash a brutal regime of white terror on the black population there in a way that really kind of stopped in its tracks the birth of a multiracial city in the Reconstruction era. It's a chilling story with much resonance today. Yeah, this is uh, leading up to the, the kind of official end of Reconstruction. I, I, I think you could argue that it was officially ended in 1877 with the, the Great Compromise, the Tilden Hayes thing, but, but really 18... It was over. I mean, yeah. federal investment in Reconstruction was over. The backlash was in full sway. But what had happened in Wilmington was there had been a freed black population there since before the Civil War, and it became a kind of magnet for freed African Americans after the Civil War and Reconstruction. Thriving port town, lots of work, lots of professions, looking for skilled employees. Um, and the black population got Powerful enough there, not very powerful, let's be clear, but they had enough power to own a few businesses, elect a few people to local office, and to play a role in policy. What was happening right then? In the 1890s, you had uh, what was then the Republican Party. And remember how politics changes. The Republicans in the fusions, Fusionist Party was in power. Uh, they were doing things like passing infrastructure spending bills, and the white aristocrats, the landed gentry, didn't like it, and they were behind the, the coup of that day in the same way that I would argue uh, we're, we saw January 6th, and I don't think that tendency is gone yet. Yeah. Uh, how is this different from, uh, you know, Black Wall Street, Greenwood, and, and, and some of these it's other very massacres similar, that we've seen? Very similar, just earlier, and uh -huh. more use of Civil War veterans and weaponry. But 1898, you're 20 years before Tulsa. Um, they will tell you in Wilmington, we were the first. Now, it's not really a claim to fame. What is so sad is that this is a history that doesn't just have resonance today, but we are looking in parts of North Carolina at, the, at a very similar use of white power and intimidation through the sheriff's department. Right. Um, yeah, this brings us to level coups that are very, very frightening and have a, a special power in that county, in that state, of state history of um, white victory. Right, which brings us to Sheriff Jody Green, who was elected by just 37 votes. Tell us this story. Well, it's very scary. So you travel 50 miles. I felt like, you know, and you have to know, Tom, I mean, I'm, the Laura Flanders show, we, we go to where other media don't. Um, all politics is local, but our media is not local. Um, right. So we go to places that have been kind of no-go areas for our, our public media. And we told a story, we researched a story with colleagues on the ground about a white power grab in this this um, small community about 50 miles west of Wilmington um, on the on the uh, rural southeast coast of, of that of that uh, state where a white sheriff at one point who described himself as a member of the Oath Keepers on his own Facebook page in 2020, Jody Green described himself that way, um, gets himself elected with a whole lot of vote shenanigans that look a lot like what happened in the county right next door where a vote harvester um, was convicted of um, ballot tampering and 
um, was about to be sentenced before he died in, in early 2019. Um, this guy, Sheriff Green, goes on after winning this very thin victory to acquire $3.8 million in military hardware under that federal 1033 program, decommissioned military hardware. Um, Trump had made it easier. Obama made it a little harder. Uh, he got a lot of ta two tanks, two mine-resistant vehicles, uh, helicopters, a whole lot of riot shields. And the people meet, we met with said, what do you need that for? This is a population of 55,000 people in the whole county. We only have 5,000 people in the county seat of Whiteville, aptly named. What do when they, they need held a, a, a tank for? Well, he will say they need it for emergency response, you know, readiness, hurricanes and so forth. But what you see if you go to their recruitment videos is nothing about, you know, earthquakes and hurricanes. You see a whole lot of policing in um, urban areas. And when the people held a gospel protest, a gospel vigil after the killing of George Floyd, several said that they saw in the sleepy streets of Whiteville um, snipers on the rooftops. I mean, that's crazy. And wow. it's scary for people that live there, particularly people who know this history. We've been here before, and they're asking themselves, you know, what time is it on the clock of this country? What are we looking at here? How are things shifting? And there's a collection, connection, of course, to January 6th, which is um, another part of the story and another scary part. It seems that this uh, outreach, uh, you know, uh, Sheriff Mack with his uh, Constitutional Sheriff's Organization, the Oath Keepers, um, the infiltration of police departments around the country by open Nazis and neo-Nazis and other white supremacist groups, and, and Donald Trump and the Republican Party's aggressive embrace of the police. Uh, Trump just a couple of nights ago uh, gave a speech in which he was saying, in fact, he, he said, I love the police, I think over 20 times in the speech. And uh, a, a, a caller of ours, Kenyatta, uh, watched it and counted them. Maybe it was over 30 times, it's some huge number. <laughs> Um, but basically trying to politicize our police forces, uh, turning them into a, a white supremacist armed occupying uh, force, essentially, an occupying army. How widespread, you know, you, you, you nailed this in, in Whitesville, North Carolina. Uh, how widespread is this across the country, Laura? Well, I think we don't know because we don't have media that are covering these stories at the local level. But we pulled together activists from across North Carolina for a discussion at the end of our show, which people can see at lauraflanders.org or on their local public television station. We pulled together a panel from the north of the state, the west of the state, the south, Durham, the capital, the coastal region. They all say the same, the same thing. Uh, and particularly in the rural areas, you're seeing not just a sort of changed atmosphere on the ground and a sense that the police are not your friends and a sense that your neighbors are suddenly calling their dogs on you as you walk in streets and on on pathways that you've walked on for years um, people feel afraid to drive at night we're talking black people here um, but you've got a parallel police force self-deputizing and again shades of what happened 1898 in wilmington self-deputized militia, which are, by the way, illegal under the North Carolina Constitution, self-deputized militia, think Klan, um, calling themselves the Oath Keepers or a breakaway group from the Oath Keepers, whose mission in life is to support local police and the sheriffs in emergency responsiveness. Now, what do they call emergency? Apparently, they call this gospel protest an emergency. Yeah. All of this is very frightening, and we see it in Washington. We don't see it when it's in Whiteville. There you go. Laura Flanders, lauraflanders.org, the website. Uh, Grit Laura on Twitter. Laura, thank you so much. And, oh, and, the, and the article is uh, titled, It Can Happen Here, A White Supremacist Coup That Succeeded, over at uh, thenation.com. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Tom. Good talking with you. We'll be right back. It's 15 minutes past the hour.